I'm Nicole. I want to start by telling you that my platform issue is my life, literally. I didn't choose my platform issue, but five years ago, it chose me when I found out I had diabetes. And ever since then, I've set, spent every moment thinking about it, wondering what I can do to change this world, what wondering what I can do to find a cure. Because <laughs> that would be wonderful for me, but would also be wonderful for others. But it's also what I feel qualifies me for this job promotion and is the reason why I've dedicated the rest of my life, honestly, to searching for this cure, but also searching for ways to help people deal with this. So let's begin a conversation. What is a seroptimist? It was a organization, just like a community service type of organization, Seroptimist International. It was just one of the clubs in my local area, and Lord. they gave a scholarship oh. to someone for community service and for what they had done during their high school years. And I won the award. So it's just with a name. It's kind of like a Greek type of system. Okay. That's the best way I can describe it for you. Oh, great to meet you. Okay. <laughs> I've had the, uh, I've worked in nursing in hemodialysis. So I've, I've seen the sometimes end result of diabetes mm -hmm. and how devastating and debilitating a disease it is. How do you inspire hope to young people who are affected and have diabetes, juvenile diabetes? Mm -hmm. Several different ways. First of all, it, it helps them a lot to see somebody who has the same thing. And I have juvenile diabetes, so I can, I'm on their level, I can understand what they're going through, I can relate to the different things that they're feeling, the emotions. They oftentimes feel shame because they have something wrong with them. So first of all, we discuss that issue and realize, and I help them recognize that they don't have to be afraid, that they can be accepted, they can be normal, they can do anything they want to do. But then other than that, other than talking about the just personal issues, we talk about medical issues and technology, how they could use technology to benefit them, to improve their quality of life, how they can use different ki types of medical uh, advances that we're making daily and how close the cure is. We talk about that, it's kind of giving them just more hope for the future. Does it make you angry that you have this disease? It did at first. It did at first. Uh, for the, about the first year, I went through a lot of denial, went through some depression. I was angry at God, which was the biggest mistake of my life, um, because I didn't understand why did this happen to me. But now, I'm not so much angry because I realize I'm actually lucky. If I had to choose a disease, I'd rather have one that we can treat, even though there's not a cure yet. I, I emphasize yet because I know that it's on the frontier. I'm actually a patient of one of the doctors who's making one of the greatest strides in our country. So I have hope now. How has it changed your life? Oh, dramatically. Uh, it's taught me so many things. Probably the biggest lesson was sympathy and empathy for others. It helped me learn how to relate to people who are in pain mm -hmm. and people who have something wrong in their life. I had to learn that diabetes is my obstacle that I have to face, that I have to climb, the roadblock that I have to find the detour around. And then it helps me realize and gain the perspective that everybody has one of those obstacles in their life. So it enabled me to be able to communicate with others better. I have a mother who is a diabetic mm -hmm. and um, she got it older mm -hmm. after 50. Mm -hmm. And getting her to really pay attention to the educational process was very difficult. How do you plan to get the message across to make people who have it really pay attention? First of all, letting them know about the severity of the disease. I don't think a lot of people understand what the complications are. And, and just briefly, it's the leading cause of blindness, of amputations that we have to do in later life with the neuropathy, heart disease, stroke. There are so many things that piggyback onto the disease. Mm -hmm. So once we begin to communicate that to people and let them know this is what you're going to face, and give them examples, real life examples, of people who have had diabetes, for instance, like Mary Tyler Moore, who is now struggling with her eyesight and her vision. Giving them examples, you don't want this to happen, so please, please, be strong, take that initiative, go to your doctor, watch what you eat, exercise, and then that's really all you can do because it's a personal decision that the individual has to make. Let's shift gears. Sure. You want to be a national news anchor. Yes. Okay, there's a lot of news going on lately. Uh, we've talked about it in this room. Uh, I think you've probably talked about it with, with your friends <laughs> and family. Mm -hmm. And you yes. know where I'm going with this, right? Yes, ma'am. I have a different spin on this, which is you're 24. Uh -huh. Monica Lewinsky's just 25. 
-hmm. What advice would you give her, if any, to put her life back together? Seek counseling, first of all. I think that she definitely needs to go through some kind of counseling because this is just an awful ordeal. Then she also needs to refocus and figure out what her goals are. I would encourage her to go for spiritual counseling because I really think that that's how she can get through this and get past this and, and resolve some of the problems that I think she has in her life, as well as some of the problems that I think our president has in his life. So that would be my first advice. Before you talk, uh, to follow up on that, you were a writer and producer for the 700 Club and around some wonderful people like Pat Robertson. Mm -hmm. uh, have you done anything with the, um, well, the secular press, and do you find any big differences in what that would mean to you as Miss American? Yes. Actually, I've had experiences on both levels, which I feel that I'm very fortunate of having that. I entered at several uh, local television stations. I've worked for ABC, NBC, and had that experience at the same time that I was working for the 700 Club. So the environments were night and day, <laughs> trust me. And it was really, it really helped me realize what kind of journalist I want to be when I saw the different work, e work ethics and what people went through to get that story. But then uh, there are problems on both sides of the fence. So it helped me focus. I've also I had experience that was in journalism and broadcast, and then also experience in print in the secular media. Do you have a mentor? Yes, I do. Tell uh, us about him or her. Sure. I, I mentioned her just a minute ago, Mary Tyler Moore, and it's, it's probably an obvious because she deals with the same types of, of problems and obstacles that I do in my life. And I realize that she has not done everything right uh, throughout the years and throughout her life, but she's at a point where she's trying to make a difference in the world, and she's working towards finding a cure and the same issues that I'm working towards. And I think that she... She has preserved a sense of integrity, and she's just a, a worthy woman. How would you define uh, success or happiness? Are they both one and the same for you? Well, I think they are one and the same. I don't see success as winning per se, but success to me is being happy. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you're happy in your life, then you have a successful life. What would it take to make you happy? To me, <laughs> well, um, this morning you're actually getting warm because <laughs> it's freezing <laughs> out there. <laughs> we feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, to make me happy, I, I will be extremely happy when I get to see my family and my friends and my board members from Virginia. They're all coming in. They begin begin to arrive today and throughout the week. So that's wonderful. And just being here, I this is probably one of the happiest moments of my entire life, honestly because I've dreamed of this for so long. I remember laying on the floor as a little girl looking up and seeing the video clips of, that they show when the women are in the interview and thinking, oh, wow, <laughs> so this is awesome. Are you an advocate of organ donation, especially with diabetes? I know they've made great strides with pancreas mm -hmm. and in, co in combination with kidney transplants. Mm -hmm. And would you promote that with your platform? I'm sorry? Would, would, could you, would you promote that yes. along the way? Yes, it's a big absolutely. Many, many diabetics, they have to deal with the kidney transplants, like you just mm -hmm. said. And we can't get, one of the sad things about organ donation is that diabetics can't get pancreatic transplants. It's just insurance will not pay for it. No one will subsidize it, only if you're doing the kidney at the same time. But then I just recently learned, and um, unfortunately I don't know the statistic, but it's a very, very small number of people that even sign up. All they have to do is sign their name on their driver's license to be an organ donor. And I know that I am. So I'm a big advocate of that because it, one day if I need something, I would like to be able to get it and not have to be on a list where I basically have to come to the point where I'm almost dying to receive treatment. You're very passionate about your work with the di diabetes effort and so forth. What else are you passionate about? Mm. Many things, actually. Children, definitely about children, uh, and about preserving them and preserving our country and providing them with stability for their future. I'm passionate about family and our family unit. I think that it's very, very sad that we have such a breakdown in our society right now, and that's, that's really a, a big pet peeve of mine and a, and a disappointment. And I'm also passionate about my faith. I have a very strong faith, and I feel that that's really what has gotten me to the point that I'm at right now in my life, and, and both here as well, and then my family. They're the dearest things to me in the world. What about your, uh, you a vocalist, a jazz vocalist? Yes, and, yes. And uh, 
how'd you get started and oh. you love that? <laughs> well, I lo music I love. And I, I often say that I don't think that I could survive in life without music mm -hmm. because it's such an outlet and such a, a resource to express your personality. I, I would like to tell you about my talent network, and I mention it real quick. Uh, I'm singing Bot's Life, and it's very special to me, and I hate to completely dwell on the platform because there are so many other facets of my personality, but it is my anthem, and it's my theme song, and it, we came about it in a 45-minute time period, but uh, it expresses about how I feel. Thank about you. my Thank life. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Final statement you'd like to make? Sure, sure. Uh, right after I won the title of Miss Virginia, I had a friend of mine who works with the pageant. He took me to the movies and he said, Nicole, I want you to see this Disney movie because to me, this is you. And there's a quote that you need to listen to. And it, briefly, it's the flower that blooms in adversity is the most rare and the most beautiful of all. And he said, I feel like that is your life. And that is what you are to me. And that I adapted that as my personal motto because before I competed this year in Miss Virginia, last year I had competed as well, and I had people tell me, don't ever go again. Don't ever compete in the Miss America system because you don't stand a chance, simply because you have diabetes. And I had taken that advice and it devastated me. But with time I realized that that was the very reason why I should compete because I live something and I'm passionate about it and I can relate to others. So I turned that around and that adversity in my life is the reason why I chose to compete again and, and the very reason why I'm here today. And I want you to think about the 16 million people that I represent because they need an advocate, they need a spokesperson, and they need a role model. And I've been privileged enough to see that happen in the last few months and I can only imagine what would happen from here. So that's my heart. And that's my passion, and that's my motto. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you again. <laughs> thank thank Bye -bye. you. Today, I would like to welcome you into my life and invite you into my heart. So here goes. I'm what many people would consider to be a combo kid. I am fascinated by science and medicine, and I want to become a physician. I'm a hometown girl who was raised on a farm. My passion is ballet. But most importantly, I'm a woman committed to saving lives. I've been educating people in basic life-saving techniques since the incident changed my life when I was 19. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have for me. What was the incident? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I was 19, um, I pulled rescue duty twice a week. I pulled two 12-hour shifts. And one night, um, my team and I got called out on a rescue call, and it was a cardiac arrest. And when we arrived at the scene, an elderly man greeted us at the door, and he rushed us in. And we went to the back, to the bathroom, and there his wife lay. She wasn't breathing, and she didn't have a pulse. One of my team members immediately got down and started doing um, ventilations, and I immediately began doing chest compressions, while our other team members started hooking up the defibrillator. And we did everything we could for her, but we couldn't save her life. And later on that night, when we were at the hospital, and her husband was there, he kept questioning what else could have been done? Was there anything else that could have been done to help save my wife? And someone who was, at the, who was in the emergency room that was part of the medical personnel said, sometimes if CPR is started immediately after the person goes down, then they have a better chance of survival. And I was standing there, and just to see his face and the pain in his eyes, I knew that for the rest of his life he was always going to wonder, what if I had known how to do this? I might still have my wife. And so the very next day, I contacted my local community college and inquired about taking a class to become an instructor for the American Heart Association. Mm -hmm. A hotly debated social issue is assisted suicide. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to find out uh, if you believe that we should legalize it, if you're for it or against it, and your feelings about it. 
I have a lot of mixed feelings about that. I think it would be easy for me to stand here right now and to look at you and to say that I'm completely against it. But I know that if it was my mother that was lying there in that hospital bed and that there was nothing else that I could do to help her and that she was praying for the pain to stop and to die, I don't know what I would do. Um, I think that if it does become legalized, that we need to have it carefully monitored with a board. And I don't think that the physician, one physician needs to make the call. It needs to be several, and it needs to be in cases where the person is terminally, terminally ill and that there is no hope. And also, I'm not really sure that I like the idea of the physician actually administering the drug. Perhaps that needs to be someone else that's within the medical staff. You say that um, you want to be a physician in a mm -hmm. rural community. Mm -hmm. Is that directly related to the fact that you grew up in a small town, or why would you not want to go to a big, big city, big city hospital, metropolitan area? Well, it, yes, it does. It, ha it does happen to have to do with me li living on a farm and growing up in such a small community. But I realized that I wanted to be a rural physician once I got on the rescue squad, and I discovered that so many people in my community were lacking the medical care that they needed. And a part of the problem was simply because we don't have the physicians in the area. It's very difficult to draw physicians into rural areas. And part of the problem is because we just don't have as much to offer them as you do in a large city. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, so many people in my community, their health is at a very poor state because they don't understand how to take care of their bodies. And they don't understand how important it is to have regular checkups and how to take pro medications properly. And so I want to go back there and work. To uh, implement the requirement of uh, the life-saving techniques mm -hmm. in a curriculum in a small town would be fairly easy, but in your larger metropolitan, uh, metropolitan cities, it might be a little bit difficult. Have you considered how you would go about getting that implemented? Well, as you know, in North Carolina, um, there's a law that was just passed that's good, that requires all of the high schools to implement the program. And North Carolina has quite a few large metropolitan areas, such as Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And within these areas, they're saying that either the high schools can allow their teachers to become the instructors, or they can bring instructors in. And for the sake of saving money, most of them are opting to choose to let their teachers become instructors. And it's fairly easy. Um, teachers already have the experience of getting a message across. It's just that they're now going to be getting a different message across. And all they have to do is take a simple CPR and airway obstruction management course. When you do that, uh, you say that you've certified, instructed and certified approximately 400 students and teachers. When you deal with the younger uh, the kids, do you find that they're really interested in learning this, or is it something that they're kind of yeah about, or, or what is their take on this? I've had an incredible response. In fact, every student that I've come across, I've been able to train with no problem. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is because of something that I do is me immediately when I go into the classroom, and that's the scenario that I give. And I tell you what I'll tell you, I'll tell you guys what it is. I go in and I look at these students and I say, I want you to imagine that you and one of your friends is driving home from a night out, whether it's a movie or a party. You just had an incredible night out, and you're laughing, you're talking, you're telling jokes in the car. And then all of a sudden, there's a bright light that comes headed towards you. And the next thing you remember is there's a loud crash, and you wake up lying in a ditch. You slowly make your way back to what's left of the car, and there's your best friend lying there. They're not breathing, and they don't have a pulse. What are you going to do? your friend's life is lying in your hands. And that immediately grabs their attention. Mm -hmm. And they realize how important it is to understand these techniques and how to properly be able to carry them out and perform them. How so difficult is it to get uh, people in general to continue their education in that? Because obviously you don't learn it at 16 and forget about it and don't. The American Heart Association just passed a law that requires that recertification occur every two years. It used to be every year, but they have realized that that is 
a bit too much for the general public to, to expect of them, so they say every two years. But what the American Heart Association done is also, and also the Red Cross, is on, their, on the back of the cards, they have listed all the instructions for what needs, what you need to do, and each step is carefully labeled out. And that card is so small that you can just slip it into your wallet. And in fact, we recommend that that's, that's how you carry it, is in your wallet. And also, the American Heart Association contacts the members and lets them know when it's time for an update and also when changes have been made. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your ballot. How long have you been, are you still taking ballot? Oh, yes, I'll dance until I can't move anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what has it done for you? Dancing creates a feeling inside of me that I just cannot describe almost. It's such an energy. There's a feeling and an, 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 an energy there that, that is just unbelievable. <coughs> um, I've been dancing since I was small, but I've been serious for about eight years. And sometimes it helps me to escape from my troubles, and then other times it helps me just to understand the situations that I'm in better. Um, Sometimes it's a, a way for me to slip away into a different world, and then uh, like, and other times it's just a chance for me just to not to think about anything at all, and just to get away from things and just enjoy moving. Tell me what three words would you use to describe yourself? Dedicated, honest, and also hardworking. If you reach your goal of becoming a physician, would you? Um, be a big believer in organ donation. Oh, of course. Um, I'm a big believer in organ donation now. Um, I think that if you have something that you can give to someone and benefit, and that person can benefit from it, then of course, by all means, do that. I know that if I, I'm, I'm an organ donor, it's listed on my on my driver's license. And I know that when I do pass away, if there's something that I can give to someone, and if that's another chance at life, then there's there's nothing there's nothing else that I'd rather do. You've become a role model. So, what are the qualities you look for in a role model? It has to be someone I think that understands who they are as a person and how they have become who they are and. They're comfortable, comfortable with themselves and the things that they have gone through. And they realize that although perhaps they have been successful and they have achieved their goals, that there's still a lot of hard work to be done and that they can't stop. What kind of role model do you think Hillary Clinton is being right now? I really admire... Oh, time's <laughs> up. Sorry. <laughs> like wow, that went fast. I'd like to make a final statement. Um, I want to tell you about my talent piece. The piece is called Deborah, and the music that I chose is John Tesh's PS 491. But the character of the piece is based on the Old Testament prophet Deborah in the Book of Judges. And the piece is set up into four movements. The first movement is where Deborah is declaring that she is a warrior and that she is going to help the children of Israel and lead them in their fight against the Can Canaanites for freedom. And the second movement is where Deborah is at a rally and she's gathering up the troops and they march off to battle. And the third part is where Deborah is in the middle of the battle and she realizes that the only way that she's going to get through this is with God's strength. And so she prays. And then the final movement is where is the, is the battle, the finish of the battle and the victory where Deborah helps the children of Israel to once again regain their freedom. But Deborah to me is a real person, and that's the choreographer of the piece. His name is Cynthia Henderson. And just like Deborah, Miss Henderson has her own battle. Miss Henderson's fighting for her life because she has breast cancer. And just as Deborah prayed to God to give her strength, Miss Henderson prays every day of her life for God to give her the strength to make it through the day. And there's one more thing that I have to tell you. Oh. Time's up. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. You. bye, -bye. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. And I just said I miss Oklahoma. And I just want to tell you, I've had the time of my life this week being at the Miss America pageant. Uh, I've met so many great friends and developed so many relationships that I know will last a lifetime. But I think the thing that I've found that I, is most interesting is that we have a lot of things in common. As far as education, we believe it's going to take us where we need to go in life. And I'm the first female on either side of my family. Another thing that I found that we have in common is that we have a great love and appreciation for the Miss America program. You know, I think it's, it may seem silly for some people to hear this, but when I became involved with the pageant system, I did not realize that it would have this type of effect on my life. It has been so remarkable. And it has honestly taught me that I can set goals for myself and I can attain those goals. And as in Oklahoma this year, I think it's, I've had a different time than possibly previous with Oklahoma because of the bombing that occurred in Oklahoma City. Um, people have asked me, Chantel, how is your state doing since the bombing? And, you know, I reply to them that we're doing very well. We, we are turning all of this very well. But to me, it's, it's amazing what has happened to, in our state when people come together. I've always heard the statement, people power, but I never truly knew what it meant, but now I do. And as with America, I hope to teach the people of our nation what people power is all about, and hopefully bring to this nation the spirit of healing that, is, that has occurred in my state, and learn make a difference in your life. Chantel, you yes. a very beautiful name. Oh, thank you. After reading your platform, I was absolutely flabbergasted at the percentages of dropouts, 25%. Yes. I was amazed. Where did you get those statistics? I found that in the USA Today. And when I read it, I was probably just as you were, just frustrated. Because we are a society that demands so much of our young people and demands them to be educated. And if we're not requiring our young people to graduate from high school, there's a problem. We need to solve that problem. What made you decide on your question? I became um, employed by Northeastern State University in January as marketing director. And I became involved with a school to work conference or school to work program in my state by going to a conference. And since then I've been uh, I've been appointed the representative of school to work in our school of our county in Muskogee. And have now since I was put on this Oklahoma become involved on a state level, which I'm very proud of. I've done some PSAs, I've done an article that will be uh, distributed, uh, distributed throughout the state of Oklahoma, and also some radio commercials. You've established a mentoring program in your high? Yes. And uh, I assume that you think that that would help this problem of school to work, and how would it uh, help, and what is a mentor, and what is a good mentor? <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, when I developed this program, I did not realize the effect that it would have on my life. Um, it taught me that something that I, I knew but I didn't truly know, which was we were all respons ultimately responsible for ourselves. And when I was speaking to these young people, and they were so involved with the, the going to the different organizations and becoming involved with community service, they realized that they, they can make a difference for today's society. And I think what a mentor is is someone that actually um, lives their life on a day-to-day -day basis, encouraging self-confidence and self-motivation so that you can make things happen and setting goals and achieving those goals. So I think that's what a mentor is, and hopefully I was a mentor to those young people. Is there a difference between a mentor and a teacher? I think they're the one and the same. They definitely are, because I know when I grew up in elementary school and junior high and high school, all of my teachers were mentors to me. And I'm very proud that, to say that they were definitely mentors to me. I know that when I was in high school, the, the majority of the dropouts were pregnant teenage girls mm. who had no advice or help. Do you think that sex education counseling belongs in schools? You know, I think there's some type of common ground that we need to meet as a society on what we are actually going to teach in elementary school and junior high. But I do. I do think that there is definitely a need for sex, sex education in today's uh, school system because, like what you said, there's so many young people becoming pregnant, and that's unfortunate. And how early did you begin? I feel like I'm in high. <laughs> 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 we want to know. <laughs> 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 what age do you think sex, sex education is appropriate to begin in the public school? You know, I think um, sex education has a lot of different things. I mean, teaching on diseases and things like that. So I think first and second grade is not too early to teach certain things, of course. Where are we on the, uh, on the ladder, on the uh, 
timeline with the computers in their schools and things. Are these mm -hmm. young people and people your age? And just the system. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I didn't understand the system. Computers and where we're going. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the school system around my 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 um, city. I think the school systems are behind because they just don't have the funds to buy computers and to help young people keep up to date with what's going on because honestly things are changing so rapidly and I'm sure you know this as well as I do in business. There's different programs every day coming out, different software programs that it's almost impossible to keep up. But I think that our, our school systems really do need to place an emphasis on computers and keeping up with technology because that's, why, that's the way our young people can be competing in this industry. And we really need to keep them on the forefront of what's happening in far, as far as computers. What would you suggest to fix this? <laughs> I, really, I honestly think there needs to be grants given by the, by the federal government to go into um, funding for computers and software and things like that. Talk us through the School for Work program, how that works. Okay, have you ever heard of it? I actually haven't. It's a great program, and I became involved. I was just like, this is something we've always done, but it's never been put into a program. And what it does is K through six, the children are taught career awareness, what is out there and what is available to them. And then from seventh grade to eighth grade, it's career exploration. They start taking tests and deciding what they're best in, what they have talents in. And it's really amazing. They start actually focusing in on career at that age. Not a specific career, but some type of career. And then from then on, they have applied academics where they actually show how this math problem and that math problem can apply to your daily routines as a marketer, as an engineer, as a scientist. So it's really phenomenal how this program works. And then they also have those apprenticeships, and then they also um, put you on an educational path in order to receive the education that you need in order to receive your career that you want. What role should corporate America play in this? Oh, they have a huge role. In fact, everyone in our society has a huge role in the school to work program. Parents, communities, um, business leaders, uh, political figures, even education. We all have a role because when I step back and I think of this, we are the adults and they are the students. And it is our responsibility to educate these young people. And so corporate leaders have a huge responsibility because they know what they need in today's workforce. So they, who better to come in and tell them what they need? So they have a large role in this question. Yeah, okay. What are your feelings on the voucher system for schools? For private schools? Honestly, I'm a pro public schools, and I think that our government, we pay taxes in um, to support the public school system. So I truly feel that we need to make our public school systems to where everyone would want to go to a public school system. Do you think that technology has frequently? Do you think that the schools ought to push those or um, encourage the students to go on to college? What do you think the balance should be in that? You know, I think it, it takes all kinds of people to make this world tick. And it takes those people to go to their technical education, and it takes those people to receive some type of higher education. So it depends on the person. So I don't think that we need to push one or the other. It, the individual needs to make the choice as to what career they want and then we need to pursue that educational path. Talk to, talk to me about <laughs> uh, teacher being a mentor, being a teacher. Yeah. Um, I, I know I felt very lucky in school that I, I had wonderful teachers, but there's a lot of, yeah. lot of disillusioned teachers out there and disgruntled and, and give up and get lazy. Do you think there needs to be some check and balance system teachers should be forced at some point to have a little brush up? <laughs> Some type of motivational thing has big big old coming from the motivation. <laughs> that might not be a bad idea. <laughs> no, what I think would probably uh, would solve that problem is to get parental involvement. I know in my uh, school system, which was very small, I graduated with 110 students in my class, that the parents were truly involved. And if the teachers ever, ever had a problem, they did not hesitate to pick up the phone call. They did not hesitate to send a note. And so I think that that relationship helps keep the, the instructor, the teacher, they, because they know they actually do have an effect on that child's life. Not just saying, you know, you need to do this and you need to do that, but actually can touch home and make sure those things are getting done. Talk about your talent. My talent is, um, I'm singing Women in the Moon, and it's a wonderful piece. I just wanted to Miss Oklahoma, something I feel very comfortable with. And it also has a message, and that's what I like. When I sing a song, I like it to also have a message because I think it's very important. 
And it just, it just, the message is to just believe in yourself and never take no for an answer. And if you have a goal and you have a dream, you can achieve. Going back, there's a tremendous amount of uh, mentoring programs out there. Yes, sir. The type of things I'm hearing is that black people should be black mentors and black kids and white people should be mentors to black mm -hmm. kids. How do you feel about that? I think it's completely silly. <laughs> I really do. I think that um, there are all kinds of people and they can be mentors to everyone. I don't think that you should divide that up by race or sex or anything like that. I want to know if you've seen the recent controversial Calvin Klein ad and what you think about them. I have seen the ads and I, to tell you the truth, I don't like them. I just, I think they're too much on the line of pornography and I just don't agree with it. I'm a marketing person. I believe in the right to, to be able to market what your product in any fashion that you wish. But that type of marketing, as a marketer, I would never be involved with that type. So I'm, I don't totally agree with it. Did your brother and your sister encourage you in your pageant experience, and what did they advise you? Oh, they have been so wonderful. If you see on my fact sheet, I believe it says my local pageant, it says Tulsa State Fair. And at that time, my brother was showing some cows at Tulsa State Fair. And at that time, his cow actually won. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we have a double winner, so tell your family. <laughs> so we had, a, we had a great time, and yes, they do support me. So I talked to my sister last night on the telephone. She goes, she's had both a leg, not literally, but <laughs> break a leg. Like, oh, you always so well people. Yes, I am a person that has a lot of high energy, and I just I like to get things done, and I like to make other people happy. I usually go to my grandmother's, and we all play softball. You can also play softball, and it's a lot of fun. Thank you. Oh, look, time's up, and then it's an explanation. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. 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 My name is Emily Orchin, and I would just like to start by saying I have had a wonderful time here in Atlantic City. I've only been to the East Coast one other time, and I came to New York City, where I think one person is from New York City. I actually saw my aunt dancing in the Broadway musical culture in Robbins at the time, and I sat from backstage, and I didn't understand why these performers were giving their heart to these roles that they had every single night and how they continually did it. But I got to go on stage afterwards one night and looked out into this empty auditorium and I understood why. Because I wanted to do that. I wanted to be on that stage. So that's where my life has been heading from that point on. But actually the, the process of getting there took a lot longer than I thought. I was told at the age of six years old that I was like six and that I was incapable of reading up to a certain level. And I don't know if you've been around many six year olds, but when I was six I was invincible. I was uh, a person that knew everything and didn't want to be told that I was incapable. So my mother told me that it's not what you're given in life, but it's what you do with what you have that makes up who you are. And I truly believe that because I didn't have a full deck of cards when it came to literature, but I was given a passion for music and a passion for, for life and learning to act. So I started doing that, and through that, I was able to compensate the hard work that I put in with my reading. So my mother to me was my mentor. She gave me the opportunity to enjoy the things I love and overcome the things that I couldn't overcome on my own. So now that I'm a mentor, I'm hopefully giving that to the young lady that I'm mentoring this year and next year and the following year and for the rest of our lives because that's what mentors do. They don't change your lives. They just give you love and support to change it on your own. So I'm available for any questions now. Emily, I see that your ambition is to be an opera singer. Yes. It's my observation, or is it an actual fact, that women opera singers have shorter performing careers than men opera singers. Because there's probably more women who want to be opera singers and less men, there is a shortage of male singers, and that's just a fact. But yes, I would say that, that because of the up and coming stars and because of the up and coming generation who want to be involved in this field of opera, yeah, their, their careers are shorter. That's why I'm choosing not only opera, but I, I'll settle with Broadway and I'll, and I'll settle with other things too. Talk about your 
about in the platform when we get more healing communities through mentorship. Really, what it comes down to is the SMART program. The SMART program stands for Start Making a Reader Today. And I do believe in mentorship. That connection one-on-one -on -one with the person is so important to have that support and love. But reading is the key to overcoming anything in your life. If you can't read, I don't think you're going to be successful. Um, so really, healing communities through mentorship means getting out there, getting the communities involved with the children and having a uh, personal interaction with their education and kind of a take in, your, uh, in the outcome of their personal being. How do you disseminate a successful program throughout the country? What I plan to do is use corporate sponsors, large ones that are, in corp that are throughout the nation, ones that can not only give financial backing, but that can give volunteers, because that's where we try to get the corporations involved the most. It's not only giving the money, but giving the volunteers that will say, we're not writing out a check for this, we're actually involved in the program. What are some of the uh, themes of the after-school specials that you produce on KLSF? Well, the first one we did was on uh, drug awareness and mainly substance abuse, not just drugs, but alcohol, which alcohol is a drug. And we tried to uh, not only work with the Red Ribbon Week Foundation that supports saying no to drugs and leading a drug and alcohol-free lifestyle, but we came up with an oath that was just wonderful, and the children would sign that on the air, saying that they pledged to lead a drug and alcohol free lifestyle. Starting about number two out of five. Yes. The word explosive comes to mind when you think about personalities of children in birth order. Are you explosive? I would have to say I'm probably the most worrisome out of all of the siblings. I like to worry about everybody and take care of everybody. My younger sister is definitely explosive, and if you ever meet her, <laughs> she's about five foot two. She's shorter than anybody in our family, and she's 80 pounds, and she runs and does gymnastics, and she is the loudest person in the world. I've never met anybody louder than her, so I would have to say I care for everybody and take care of everybody. You composed and recorded your first song at age 11. Maybe the songwriter. Talk about that first, that your songwriting. Well, my songwriting was, it was something that I didn't plan out. I didn't say when I was 11, oh, I'm going to start this, and I'm going to write a song, and I'm going to record it. It was a, it was a big change in my life. My uh, choir director in the sixth grade realized that I was writing songs in the back of the class instead of uh, memorizing my music, which I was supposed to be. So because I already had... Uh, had the ability to read music and memorize very quickly, I didn't need to. So when I was writing these songs, he would pick them out of class and he would ask me to sing them, thinking that I would be embarrassed. Of course I wasn't. I, I just got up there and, and I loved that. I would go to the piano and start playing and singing. And so then he got me in contact with his uh, manager and they produced the background music for several of my songs. And that summer was the hardest summer of my life. I remember having to do 60 takes on one phrase. I won't ever do it again. Does anything really scare you? I think the biggest thing that scares me, and I would say the only thing that scares me, is having to read a script. Because still, today, the words blur off the end of the page for me. It's not like dyslexia is gone out of my life. It's there. I've just learned to deal with it. And I've learned to say, you know, I'm not a... I'm not a fast reader, you know, and if you're going to give me a reading assignment that's chapter long and I have to have it done by Wednesday, I usually tell the teacher, I'll be reading in class that day, so uh, give me a little extra time, and I understand. Given that um, cancer and heart disease have probably still kill more people each year than AIDS, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, too much focus on AIDS and HIV, even that it's been used as a scare tactic and blown out of proportion. What do you think about that? My uncle has AIDS, and I personally say that anyone who is dying, we give them anything they need to be comfortable, to be happy, to start going through the death process, which is forgiveness and love, and really, you know, he's going through that. He's coming here, and he's going to watch me for fun. In fact, he performed as a Miss America dancer a long time ago, so he's really excited to come, and I do support the the research for AIDS, just as I support any disease that's going to kill someone in the long run. Who are some of the role models in the country? 
the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis is mm -hmm. definitely my favorite. Oh, she's, she's so graceful in her clothes. The way she can make a small issue become the most important issue in your life just is something that I've always wanted to have. The other person is Janet Reno because she takes the bull by the horns and says, it's going to stop with me. So I really, those two, between the two of those, I think I can get a pretty good combination. I'm like, do you think that Senator Parker's got off easy by resigning? No, no, I don't. He, he definitely went through torture in our state. And not everyone in our state agreed with him resigning. He's a very good senator, but he's also a very sick man. And he needs quite a bit of help and counseling. What I'm focused on now with this packet issue is that we have one month to run an election to get a new senator in to his shoes, and they are big, big shoes. Young people today are quite taken by computer games and video arcades and uh, slick entertainment, so to speak. And there's going to be some voiceovers for uh, some computer games. What do you think about the, the computer games and video games that uh, receive so much um, criticism in our society? The ones that I did actually were aimed towards the math and science departments. They were very uh, academically oriented. I don't support things like Mortal Kombat or Pac-Man, things that do not really test the intelligence of a person and have them go beyond just hand-eye coordination because you can get that out of basketball, I know. <laughs> but I would say that definitely, if you're going to let your child play, watch them. They have them in every computer store available for you to go over them before you get them. So go through them. Don't just buy something that they want. Get them something that they can be challenged by and that they can say, oh, I learned this and this and this off of that day. If you, <coughs> excuse me, if you were not so talented vocally, what would be your backup career? I would have to say stand-up comedy because <laughs> <laughs> if you see my dancing skills, which you all will, you will giggle. So <laughs> I would just interpret yeah. the dancers, and uh, yeah, it would have to be dancing. Since you are so talented vocally, what are you dying to sing? What role are you dying to sing? Well, I wouldn't mind you know, singing the lead role for Beauty and the Beast. No, <laughs> <laughs> no my, my aspirations definitely are aimed to the sound of the opera. That was the first musical I ever saw on Broadway, so I saw that. <laughs> that was my role. That was me up there, so I definitely would have to say. Yeah, if you were in the presence of our president, and you had questions of him or her future, how would you address the president? Well, president Clinton. But if I was meeting him a second time or a third time, it would have to be President Bill Clinton because I do feel closer to him than I have any other president. Maybe it's because my age and being aware of the presidential candidacy, but I do believe that he has come to the Northwest and taken interest in our crises that have been going on much more than any other president has. Is there any question that you wanted to be asked that we can answer? Well, I have questions for everyone else. Just what you were talking about, the crises in your state, what you consider the, the primary crisis. The primary crisis right now is definitely some of the pathways, but there are so many. We have the timber industry that is still, it's devastated. And I do support the, the environment, but we need to find a balance, and we have gone too far in one direction now, and we need to now reverse and find that balance between bringing corporate sponsors into our area and keeping the balance between nature and that industry, because that was our largest industry. Can women be role models for young boys? Absolutely. Absolutely. It goes beyond gender. In fact... years ago, the first Miss America, if she'd been old enough, couldn't have passed her first vote. And since that time, the Miss America pageant has continuously been in the forefront of changing the leadership psychology of women. As a result, our students were called senior, given the opportunity to be a national advocate for the public health approach to preventing juvenile delinquency. I'm sure all of us in our lives have had circumstances in which we didn't choose an issue, but an issue chose us. 
And I can remember as a 12-year-old girl sitting around the dinner table hearing my dad's experiences and frustration in his uh, prison ministry experience that no one had received men at an earlier age. And consequently, I began volunteering with at-risk youth programs while in high school. Uh, even after years of experience and the opportunities provided to me as Miss Illinois, the job of being Miss America, of being a national advocate, requires more. And so I've spent the summer establishing a basis of networks in which I can draw upon so that when I go into a community, I can assess their individual risk factors and know that motivate them to action. Uh, one of the most inspiring meetings I had this summer was with Eli Sedell, the head of President Clinton's Corporation for National Service, in which we discussed the power of mentoring. Uh, the job of Miss America, I don't think, is about me. It's not about Tracy Hayes, but it's about what a community does once I leave. And I'm hoping that by knowing a community's specific risk factors and challenging them, they can stand by me, and together we can make a difference, so that we can save these children one child at a time. Great. Coming into closer to the area where I live, population 11,000, uh, we should assess our risk factors. <laughs> uh, we have <laughs> a lot of things because there's a hangout place that the, uh, uh, the coming to meet with the young people. They're beginning to wear bandanas and colors and things in Carthage, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a rural community with a couple of uh, industries. We have a uh, pretty good school system. What are our risk factors? Uh, economically, we're probably below poverty level. Okay. The, the risk factors are broken up into four components. Communities, individual schools, and then also in individual schools, communities, and then also what programs are established there. So you want, the, and the public health approach is integrated. So you want to incorporate in the school, for instance, I know that I have a sister who's 14, and they can't wear specific colors to school. They can't even wear uh, sweatshirts that have a college logo on them because that's become a, a part of the game affiliation. So you have to address it in the schools by having those programs and also having at least teaching conflict resolution sites also. Uh, in the community, what you want to do is get the entire community involved in the process by bringing in specific programs. Boys and girls clubs are probably established there. It's, it's more or less getting an awareness out and getting people from different facets of the community to become involved in this process and then draw the kids in by teaching parents, school, school officials, uh, churches, different people, having them all send the kids to these programs. But it all starts with awareness. How important is reparation and the victim to the defendant? Reparation is, can only be applied in a non-violent uh, type of crime. And, and the one program that really addresses that really well is the VIRC program, which is Victim Offender Reconciliation Program. And it's been started by a number of churches in California in which they assign trained mentors to go in and work with these kids, and they set up meetings with, with the child, say a child has um, spread the CD on someone's house. They bring the child to the person, the person whose house was spread, and they meet together. And in that sense, the child learns the consequences of what they've done, because oftentimes they totally miss that. Even going through the court system, some of the kids they run into don't understand why, you know, I've spread someone's house 12 times, and yet now, now I'm being punished for it. They don't quite understand that. So, reparation of the victim, actually having to do something in order to make up for, or obviously some sort of punishment for the crime that involves restoring the victim, really makes a difference. Many say that there is a lost generation in this country. What is your opinion of that? Are you saying to Generation X? No, no Generation X. <laughs> uh, generation X, I think, has gotten a bad rap. I think, if anything, our generation is one of the forms in which we're really coming out and, and trying to establish things that, that we want to change in all facets of society. So I don't know that we're a lost generation per se, especially now. I think if we're becoming more aware and we're trying to instigate changes, uh, I think it's a lot for all. How, how was it that you got to speak at the American Correction Association? Mm. That was through a connection I made in establishing this basis of networks to really find out what risk factors were established throughout the country, so, uh, or setting up that basis so I could when I was going to, to a particular community. Uh, Bobby Husky, the president of that corporation, met with me. He asked if I would want to come and speak with a committee that was talking about at risk youth. So that was, that was really special for me. I was really enjoyed it. And so you said that your father was a financial consultant and retired Navy pilot. You mentioned that in prison ministry? Yes. 
she's always been involved in going into the prisons and teaching Bible studies uh, to in men's facilities. And so uh, it's, it's just been something that's always been a part of my life. Has your mother gone into the room crash moment? I don't know if I can tell the story now. She went in with my dad one time and he was just trying to get her to come in and she went in and she kept going through the nerve detector and they kept saying she, she didn't know what else to take off and I said, No, 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 you're always talking about people being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any place where you have ever been given an advantage because of your appearance? Uh, I don't know that I've been given an advantage. If anything, I would say that I immediately jumped to the defense because I think a lot of people will see someone who is attractive, especially a blonde, and assume, hmm, she must not be very bright. I mean, I encounter that all the time. And and people in, in finding out that I'm involved with the Miss America system also see when they're not aware of what this program is about, think, oh, well, yeah, yeah, of course you are. And they don't realize, I think, that you can't judge someone by their appearance. So if anything, I don't think it's, it's enhanced what I've done. If anything, I've really tried to work to always let people know that I'm not just a pretty face, but there's no depth there. Tracy, why a broadcast journalist? Mm -hmm. I've actually wanted to be a broadcast journalist since I was in about the first grade. And at first it was a glamour thing. Um, but now I really enjoy the versatility of it. I interned for a year with a CBS affiliate. And just being able to do so many different things, whether you're editing, whether you're going out on a story, whether you're interviewing someone, you really have your finger on the pulse of what's going on. And there's nothing monotonous about broadcast journalism. And that's what I love about it. You've written, produced, and edited many things. No, I was an intern. So I've, I've been able to do things. Never, never allowed to be on air. But yes, I was able to go out and to edit and to you know, pretend and to talk on the, on the monitor and move all the equipment. So it was really fun. And it really helped me to see that, yes, this is what I wanted to do, having that experience. And for some reason, you were not able to do this. Did you have a backup plan? Broadcast journalism? Yes, if for some reason you were not able to go into this, what would you choose? Uh, I would love to be see print uh, if, if I couldn't do journalism. If journalism as a whole was excluded, I would love to go into education. I would have vacillated between whether I wanted to be a teacher or go into broadcast journalism because I've always worked with kids and enjoy that so much. So that would be a profession I wanted as well. In the recent college has a wonderful reputation. What has you um, What is your fondest memory of your college years? Chapel. We have chapel Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and they bring different speakers throughout the country to the school, and we all have an opportunity to come together as a community and uh, sing and, and then listen to a speaker, and it really fosters such a sense of, of community, and it's so neat to know that all of the students that I'm going to school with have such a strong faith, and we can really support each other, and I, I was just talking to my boyfriend, and he said, oh, there's a group group that met together after a group that we prayed for you, and that, and that was just so neat for me to hear, so uh, I love chapel. How many students? He's 2,700. Why is the prison population rising in this country, especially with the It's rising because our nation has traditionally reacted to crime uh, with, with punishment and harsher measures, as opposed to using the public health approach, which address, addresses it at the grassroots level and tries to prevent the behavior that leads to crime in the first place. We can have harsher and harsher measures, but we're not addressing the behavioral modification that needs to be addressed. Tracy, media communication, computer, mm -hmm. internet, email, you seem to have lost the ability to communicate with one another uh, because of that. Can that be changed? We look at human relations skills. Uh, can that be picked up again? I hope it can. I think it can. In the different inner city ministries, I was able to visit a uh, uh, a NeuroCorp program in the downtown district of Washington, D.C., in which they really tried to bring together a whole neighborhood, and they would, it was almost like traveling back in time, where they would come out and talk over the fence. It wasn't just talking on the phone, using technology. I mean, people used to spend time out on their porches communing with one another, and, and you're right, we don't see that anymore. But in trying to bring a community together by working with the youth, by uh, addressing different community protective and risk factors, I think that that almost instigates more of a, a community feel. Talk about your parents. I'm seeing you tonight from West Side Story, and 
Believe it or not, I didn't see it because I thought they had to do with things. I thought that was my class. I was happy you were there. I knew it. But I didn't actually even think about it. And so just a couple of weeks ago, I thought, well, I love that. I love the song tonight. And in looking for a tiny song, I've been classically trained. But I don't really enjoy singing opera. And I didn't want it to perform opera for my talent Miss America. I wanted to do something Broadway. And so tonight was perfect because you can sing it in a classical style. But it also is such a fun song. It's a song of anticipation. And it fits in perfectly with the way I'm going to be feeling when I perform it that night. Um, so, oh, for as long as I can remember, I mean, our family used to travel on trips and we would bring along books and sing harmony. And so I've been training for about six or seven years, but music has always been a part of my life. And besides music, what's fun for you? <laughs> I love to dance. I danced up until I was in high school every day after school. And so in and I didn't have to do a lot of other things. So when I stopped dancing, uh, I took up crew and, and started doing all these other things. And all of a sudden, I thought, wow, I, I have muscles. You know, I was never allowed to do all of these things. Uh, but I still enjoy dancing. The production members have been great in rehearsal. Ticket access is that talent that I haven't used in a long time. Do you get up in the morning? Are you grouchy or are you aggressive and ready for the day? No, I'm up and at him. I'm definitely a morning person. At night, I'm conking out. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm up at the crack of dawn and, and ready to go. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh